right, welcome back to Long Island's number one pro wrestling broadcast. Monty DeFaro, only seen here out of Indie Music TV, straight out of Rock Ockham of Long Island. Abe, thank you for showing up on this weekend and taking your time out. Of course, brother. And to the right, special guest, went to the bullpen, <laughs> Mr. Boston, Mr. President, Phil DeCessere. How are you, buddy? Quite a surreal, surreal moment here. How did Monty. it feel to get the call? Well, there's a couple of things going on here. Yeah. You got the late call, got the late literally call. minutes late. Yep. And then on the couch is probably, I don't know, top ten most iconic pro wrestling figures in the history history of pro wrestling. Yeah. So now you have to step in. Yeah. And do an interview with this guy. It's a good thing I know a lot about him, and I've, it's a good thing I've watched him over the years too. Did you? So, Magnum, we were talking earlier, you know, we'll run through our shtick, but we want to thank you for joining us. How was your day at the big event today? It was uh, it was great, not for the reason I thought it was going to be great, but it was great because I got to connect with some folks that I haven't seen in a really long time. And, uh, you know, you can't ever, like, take anything for granted about when you're going to see someone again, much less get to see someone you haven't seen in 35 or 40 years. And uh, these events always bring people from all over the, the United States. And uh, I, I saw some, some faces today that, I, that meant a whole lot to me back in the day and over the years, and I've totally lost contact with. So being able to make some of those uh, connections again was, uh, was really cool. Does that affect you when your, your brotherhood, they pass away? I mean, how, how, how do you handle that? Because I always envision the pro wrestling world as being this really close circle family. And, you know, you have your regular family, of course, which is absolutely important. But now you have the secondary family, and it's like double the fun, double the pain. Is that maybe it, a good reference? It is. Uh, it's so funny you should say that because I was just telling my son that very thing this afternoon, that the relationships that we developed – traveling up and down the road together, experiencing all the things we did, the highs, the lows, good times, bad times, all the trials and tribulations and everything, somehow knit you together tighter than you know most families uh, cause it, because it's a 24-7 kind of bond. It's not just a, you know even a normal family and dad's going off to work and, or, ma, or both are going off to work and they interact with, with folks you know during the given periods of time. We traveled together, we worked out together, we worked in the ring together, and, and it was, it was all-encompassing. So to your point, you, know, you, you have these bonds, and they're so intense that you can not speak to somebody for, for 10, 20 years, and the minute you, you do, you pick right back up where you left off with the same emotion, the same connection, the, the you know the same com common love of what we once did together it's just it's just really uh like I, i'm sure the the military is probably very similar mm. for people that have served and you know served our country and done things like that that level of intensity though so, you know you take guys that have, that have five ten twenty year careers in our industry you're really engulfed in other people's lives so yeah, it, it's uh, it's tough. It's tough when you lose them. My best friend in the world was American Dream Dusty Rhodes, and uh, he passed away on my birthday. Mm. And and the and the last time that I saw him was in New York at the big event, and and we and my my son then who's traveling with me now was a little boy, and he got to meet this guy that he'd heard his dad talk about and spend about four or five hours sitting and listening to him talk and listening to he and I interact. And then six months later, he was gone, and he passed away on my birthday. And, uh, you know, those leave marks in you that, uh, you know, you don't ever forget. You just It's just a constant reminder of how, you know, precious every moment we have in life is. Well, you, again, it's very hard. Like in regular life, right? You meet people, you work with them, you move on to another job. You mention the military. Uh, it's hard to keep up and and you know keep everybody in your life because you're busy. You know everybody's busy. Do you ever feel guilty? Like, man, I should have reached out to that guy a little more. Uh, you know that type of thing. Well, my situation is a little. You know, we, they're all everybody's situations are all different. But mine is even a little bit more different even yet in that. 
I was at the top of my game at 27 years old, had a career-ending automobile accident that in the blink of an eye changed my whole career path and everything I thought I was going to do in life. And yet, so people saw that, felt sorry for me that I didn't get to achieve my goals or didn't get to do the things that were forecasted for me that, that you know, have been talked about over many, many times over the years. But they don't realize that the greatest loss for me wasn't the, the performing in the ring. It was that, that interaction with the people that I loved. And it wasn't that they didn't want to interact with me, but I could no longer take part and be involved in it to the capacity that I was. And I was still a very young man that had to go find his way and make another path. So, the, but those feelings, that intense and only almost about seven years in the ring and the friendships that I developed, uh, the ones that are all still alive today are just as strong as they were 37 years ago. And I should mention your son. Obviously, everybody knew what a good-looking guy or a good-looking guy Magnum T.A. is and what an idol he was. It looks like your son's uh, right behind you there, buddy. Well, you know, and, and, I, and thank you for saying that. And, of course, I feel the same way. And, and I, I've, got, I've been blessed to, to raise seven children. And, and he and his twin sister are the last two of the seven. And, and of all the children, uh, he's got the, the most, uh, I guess, desire-driven feelings that kind of related to the same things that I had as a young man. So uh, I wouldn't be so surprised if a couple of years down the road he might be able to throw his hat into that same equation because it's just uh, today it's a different business. It's a different animal. It's, it's much more uh, you know, calculated and, and things that you can do to take a path to try to try to get there. When, when I was trying to break into the business, you might as well say you wanted to go walk on and play with the NFL mm, because yeah. it was that closely guarded of a thing there wasn't wrestle there wasn't a channel there wasn't wrestling schools there wasn't these ways that you could set this as some kind of career path of something you might want to do and today in reality you, you know you can do that i mean you you can get at least get a shot at a real shot to see measurably whether you've got what it takes or not and uh, you didn't have that ability 30 40 years ago Phil, I think you got to run off about 100 photos of them real quick. Let's get some signatures. Yeah, just get, look at that, just huh? get prepped, right? Yeah, man. Wow. What, what, what do we get for those? Like 100 a pop? Probably, Not bad. Yeah. <laughs> run 1,000. There you go. <laughs> I would like to be thank the band that sings a theme song for Monty Nefaro and Jimmy Farrow, who lives in Florida right now, along with his partner, Bart Griggs, a part of the band Wisteria Hall. Wisteria right. Hall sings such great. What did you say? Bartman. Look at you. Bartman. You're making them proud right now. Gotta well do done, it. sir. <laughs> Mysterio Hall sings such great songs as In My Dreams, This Life, Not Far Behind, Here Comes the Rain. You can find their music on the Wisteria Hall YouTube page. Hit that like button. There you go. Go to Spotify, download Apple Music Reverb Nation. If you didn't know it, you are watching Long Island's number one pro wrestling broadcast, Monty Nefaro. Catch us on the Monty Nefaro YouTube page. Where are you? Where are we? You lost. Like and subscribe. Go to the Facebook Club. Listen, you're coming out of the bullpen. I get it. It's all good. Arms a little it's, stiff. it's a little stiff. <laughs> Hear us on iHeartRadio, Spotify, Anchor, Twitch TV. If you're lucky enough to live in New York, we will get the reduced version yeah. of this broadcast with this icon on Channel 115 every Tuesday at 9.30 p.m. or Saturday morning with your cereal and coffee at 11 a.m. and Channel 20 on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. We're also part of a network called Intuitive. That's a free network. Check this out, Magnum. It's a up and growing Netflix. It's a free app. It's i n 2 i T-I-V-E network. It's got documentaries. It's got comedy. It's got everything, yeah. you know. And Drama. the head of it, Monty Nefaro. It's got the best at the job. That's right. We'll be right back with this icon in just a few short minutes. Thank you, man. Manscape. Uh huh. Uh, you know, have you tried the new equipment that's been sent? I'm afraid because it says weed whacker. <laughs> I'm scared. Maven, Manscape. What are you thinking about Love Manscape, it. dude? You Love it. it. What do you use it for? Necessity. <laughs> what don't I use it for? Put it this way: <laughs> the only hair I have on my entire body is these eyebrows. Yeah. That oh. you see. 
these wow. caterpillars racing to the middle of my nose. That's it. That is it. That's all. That's all I have, and that's all I want. That's the so pick. manscaped. There's a must. We were talking before the show. There's nothing worse than just hair. Yeah. Right? Hair on a woman, hair on a man. It's just bad. Absolutely. And it's the one thing that the older I get, it starts growing more in unwanted areas. Absolutely. I hate it. I'm going to ask you a question. Uh Uh-oh. Just going to go out there. Oh, boy. Go for it. You're doing a deed. Yes. (laughs) Again, I don't want you to admit this because we... As men, we try not to admit this, but if you're going to oh, go do the deed it. on a woman, I know would you rather have her be hairless or a little hair, racing stripe, or <laughs> racing stripe. full retro bush? <laughs> racing well, stripe. Retro bush is out. Yes, thank you. Retro bush is out. Yeah. Um, I don't mind a small, well-manicured landing strip. <laughs> Every now and then, if it's completely, and I'm talking like baby's ass bald, Mm. Then I, I start, where is that pedophilia line that yeah. I'm, that I'm, I don't, I don't wow. want to wander into that. Wonder, that's very interesting. Like that. I never thought about wow. that. You're a smart dude. Holy yeah. shit. So if the landing strip is clean enough for the plane to go in smoothly, you're cool with that. If the landing strip is, has, like I said, well manicured, yeah. you yeah. can see both sides. It's not like blinking lights on both sides of that. Landing? I just don't, I don't want, <laughs> you know, I don't want the shrubbery going off into yeah. unwanted areas on that gotcha. as well. Gotcha. Oh, yeah, look but what you found. Ooh, I got to be all honest gotcha. though. Hey, the, ah. the, the older I get though, I don't. I think I don't think I can be as. Uh, <laughs> I a, a, found it. Have, I found have it. Have you ever gone down there and like just like you, she slowly brings down the underwear? Then what is retro? Just, Absolutely. Retro? You're like whoa. Wow. Yeah, like, I'm 46, like it pops out. Do you like walk out or what do you do? No, I, try, I muster through. I muster up the courage to get through. Trooper. Yeah. He's a trooper. <laughs> got to give him an yeah, Not all. Not all heroes wear capes. Yeah, I, there you no, go. I hear you. I, you listen, can't, I couldn't. I Super couldn't say. Bush. I couldn't say. Well, <laughs> if you have the same beliefs as Maven does, Manscaped could help you. Absolutely. The weed whacker. Absolutely. What are you thinking? I'm thinking that I may have to like you know go in a room, close the door, and hang out with the weed whacker for a little while. Yeah, I think you're a retro guy, aren't you? I like 70s adult films, if that's what you're getting at. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, but with that, Ron we're going to take a quick Batman. commercial break, and we'll be back with this wrestling icon, Maven. We will see you in a drop kick second. Uh-oh. Drop kick. All right, welcome back to Long Island's number one pro wrestling broadcast, Monty and Farrell, only seen here out of indie music TV. Magnum, TA, thank you, sir, for joining us. Pleasure, guys. It is an honor. So how's your health? Health is good. Uh, when you have, when you have twins that are, you know, 16 years old, and you're full full time employed, you don't have any ch- choice but to be good. You've got to, you've got responsibilities, things to do that aren't going to happen if you don't do them, and uh, you stay in the game. That's great. That's great. We were talking before you got in. We were just, just spitballing, and Buzz Sawyer's name came up. Are you on the Buzz Sawyer I burnt you list? I am on the financially burnt list, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, I, I told that story a little bit on the Dark Side of the Ring episode I did uh, uh, this past year. And uh, yeah, The Undertaker and I both have common bonds with uh, Buzz Sawyer. And, uh, but, you know, in, in retrospect, you take a guy like me who – had never had a wrestling lesson one, traveled from my home of Virginia 3,000 miles away to run Buzz down in uh, Portland, Oregon. Worked out in the ring one time with Buzz and Princess Victoria for about two hours and started wrestling the next night live on television to, for a promoter, Don Owens, who was told that I had been working in the business for six months for Bill Watts by Buzz Sawyer. And I suddenly found myself in the game, working full time, learning on the job experience, not letting in, being able to let anyone know that I didn't know what I was doing and having to learn it all live. So did I get burnt for some money? Yeah, I did. I got, I got burnt for some money that was very substantial for back in that time. But the fact of the matter is, had all the circumstances not played out the way they did, uh, the story probably wouldn't come out the same way. But you so. got the end result, so you're like, ah, it's over. When you did get burnt, because I believe what you borrowed it from your parents, the money? My grandfather. Your grandfather. 
when you got burned for it, w were they upset with you, or were they like, okay, look, people take advantage? Like, what, what? How was that conversation? It was never mentioned because oh, wow. I got in, because yeah. the goal was just to get in. They they never knew all the circumstance that it was a burn for the simple fact that I was in the game and we were we had had it portrayed to us that a wrestling license to get in the business with this clandestine world of wrestling was a huge expense when in reality that wasn't the truth but in their minds because they weren't smartened up to the way the business worked uh, no one no one knew all that story until way down the road uh, mm. it, it wasn't something and, and, and because it wasn't no expectation of it needing to be repaid or anything. My grandfather believed in me. I'd worked with him from the time I was old enough to pick up a shovel and an axe and do things around his farm. Uh, and he believed in me and knew that, I, I, that if I put my mind to it and uh, was 100% committed, that I was going to be successful. So uh, that same grandfather, along with my other grandfather, got to see me five years later selling out in Norfolk Scope wrestling Ric Flair for the World's Heavyweight Championship. So there was no uh, bad investment in his mind. And it's quite, yeah, it's quite the story, right? He, get to, he got to see the fruits of uh, his assistance in your career. It's a pretty incredible story. Uh, at some point in your career, you were in Florida Championship Wrestling, correct? Uh, one year into the business, I was at Florida Championship Wrestling. Yes. Did you have a relationship with, I think Eddie Graham was still running the organization at that point. I, Did, I loved Eddie Graham. His son, Mike, had come to San Antonio where I was working for Joe Blanchard uh, doing a guest spot. And he and I met up, uh, immediately had some kind of crazy bond, like we were like, like brothers disconnected with a different mother or something. It was just weird. And uh, he liked me so much that he went home, told his dad, hey, got this big, good-looking kid down in Texas that, that needs to come to Florida and learn the ropes. And he did. He took me on the road with he and his dad. I flew in, in uh, Eddie's private plane with him. Eddie would stand in the back with me every night, watch the matches with me, talk to me through the whole thing, explain to me what was good, what wasn't good, about psychology, why you did this, why you did that. And it was an education that you couldn't pay for for $100,000, uh, you know, much less, you know, I anything else. And it was, uh, it was what fast-tracked my ability to absorb, you know, the, the nuances that you need to have to be successful in the business. Yeah, and uh, Eddie was quite a, quite a creator and quite a mind. And, um, of course, uh, he passed away Super Bowl night, I understand, in 1985, and uh, certainly Mike followed thereafter, and just it seemed like a, a rash of tragedies in that family, and something that's become kind of epidemic in the United States. Uh, how did those deaths affect you, Magnum? The, the fact of, of, of the matter is, you know, there's, there's mental health challenges, as you said, you know, stated across America. And we live in a very high profile, you know, business type, you know, situation. So our, you know, our struggles and, and things that go on in the wrestling industry, you know, the, the world sees it as played out. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I was, I was watching, uh, watching the Super Bowl with Dick Slater when I heard about uh, Eddie and, and just couldn't believe it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, years later, Mike and I, were working for WCW together, and uh, I was I was Dusty's assistant, and, and Mike was an agent, and and countless nights, you know, I listened to Mike just, you know, basically just crying about the loss of his dad, his best friend, and and you know what what it had done to him personally, and you know that loss. So for Mike to have ended up going down that you know that same path, and his son, and his son yeah. did as well. You know, it just it, it it tells you that there's a there's a chip, there's something. The Von Erichs, you know, same yeah. same thing. And uh, you know, our world is is so high profile, and so much importance put on perceptions and how the world perceives you and and your persona. That when things go awry in that world, and suddenly 
things were out of control and you, you can no longer be that which you've always measured yourself by, things can fall apart real quickly. And I believe Eddie had had something happen that was, you know, potentially going to put him in a very compromised situation that he he just couldn't wrap his head around, couldn't cope with. You know, Mike had been hugely successful uh, at different points of time in his life. Remember when he was 30 years old and 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 him and I were, uh, you know, running around together, and you know, big boats and you know, Rolexes and this and that, and the other, and all the things and the accolades that came from being a Graham to, you know, that empire crumbling and humbling yourself to work, still go out and work hard, but realizing you could never be back where you once were and all those unmet expectations of life are just so overwhelming for someone's coping skills that there's some challenge there. Yeah. And uh, it, it, it greatly affected me. And I've, i I'm thankful that, you know, somehow, you know, God's given me the ability to navigate those things because I certainly, you know, had something happen to me that, that could have taken me one way or another. Sure. And, uh, you know, and, and I'm, I'm thankful that for me it was a challenge rather than a, a death sentence. Yeah. You know, so, you know, it, it's terribly impactful and, and, and it's sad for the families. It's sad for, you know, his little girl, Nicole, that uh, I still follow on Facebook and interact with and, and see what's going on in her life. And I remember how special she was to her grandpa, too. I remember being over at Mike's house when he lived on the fingers there in, uh, in, in Tampa and her doing chin-ups in the doorway and her dad <laughs> and grandpa, you know, cheering her on to do things and just how much life was in that family and suddenly to be, yeah. you know, in such disarray and, and, and talking to, uh, you know, Carrie Von Eric's daughter, hear similar stories of the happy times and all the, the good things that they got to interact with as a family. But the thing they're remembered for is this tragedy. And it's a shame because it's not what defines what they were all about. It was, uh, it, it was you know, it was horrendous. It, it's it's the, the worst way anybody can think about things ending up. But it well, wasn't can I who ask they you, were. Can I interrupt you on that, though? Yeah. Do you feel maybe suicide is a selfish performance, though? I understand there's mental health issues, but the people that are involved, like the, the children you're speaking about, isn't there a form of selfishness behind that? You know, I can't judge it, because if you're not sitting in the shoes so overwhelmed that you feel like you can't even breathe or you don't know how you're going to exist for another moment, I can't judge what goes through a man's head. Uh, I... I, I you know, it's easy to say, you know, just totally on paper, absolutely it looks selfish. But for that person, you know, at that moment, all they could see potentially was something they were going to bring on that was going to be far worse than them being left and out of these people's lives. And I don't think the intent at that point is just to escape, to get out of pain. I think in most of those folks cases they really thought they were doing someone a favor i'll come at a different angle then he's a friend of yours close friend of yours i mean we had barry windham in here and i asked him the same question were you angry at him were you angry at mike were you angry at eddie for doing that i don't know if anger is the right word or not had had it been right there and and feel like they misled me and I could have helped and and could have helped try to navigate that that troubled time. I might have been angry. Uh, it, for me, it was just sadness, you know, I, and I can see Barry and I've talked about it and I know the conversations he and Mike had had and Mike had had foretold of things that had made Barry feel like that he was had the propensity to do that. And Barry was very much of a mindset that he was not going to be an enabler in that way, in any way, shape, or form, and and support that as being an option. So for Barry, I could see where there would be an anger uh, because it, he was that on that level of, of of the of the confrontation, and it would be hard as as a man not to to take that personally, like like almost you know how dare you 
you know, do this, you know, with all we've been through and because of our brotherhood and, and all that. And uh, but for me, it, it, it's just sadness because I, I look at just the heartache and the grief and the loss. The, the, my family's everything to me, and I would I'd fight, you know, through anything imaginable to protect them. And not being there to protect them is the worst thing that you could ever do. I'm going to change gears a little bit. Um, we have a lot of, again, we were talking to you earlier, we were WWE guys. I uh, can't speak for you, Phil, completely, but right. I was. And the Age of Cable is where we get to see these other wrestlers doing something totally different and quite incredible. So when we have the former NWA guys, Mid-Atlantic guys in here, um, there seems to be a mixed bag. And obviously he's your friend and your mentor, Dusty Rhodes, but... Many of them were under the opinion that Dusty was about Dusty all the time, right? He always found a way to make sure he stayed over no matter at what cost or what price. What's your response to that? And my response to it is this. Dusty could step outside the box and look at Dusty as a talent. As from Virgil Runnels looking at Dusty Rose just like, like another guy he's got on his roster. Because... Dusty made more money booking than he made in the ring, okay, mm -hmm. straight up. I mean, like triple what he made actually wrestling. And he knew that he was going to get all the squeeze he could get out of all the major players. Now, there's times in his career where, you know, when he was in Florida and they were just shoveling heels at him, heels at him, heels at him, building them and then beating them and whatnot, I could understand it. But during my era and my interaction with him, uh, he had invested in me like probably no one else has ever been invested in by one person in this business. Uh, the Crockett's told me if I'd leave Mid-South and come to work for them, they'd give me the biggest push anybody had ever got in the wrestling industry. And they made good their word, and Dusty was the one that made them believe in me and told them what he saw in me. And he was pushing me to surpass what he had done. I wasn't, I hadn't done it yet, but the die had been cast. The votes had been cast. It was, it was coming. And so when I went down, there was no plan B. So Dusty was still here at, at, at that tip top level of his ability to perform. And the whole company went into this, we got to grab superstars to, to, to bring in, to keep this momentum going and all this thing. And so he fell right into that piece, piece of it. Had he been the selfish man that he's sometimes portrayed to be, he wouldn't have ever been grooming and pushing me to be where he was pushing me to be. And so no one else had that relationship with him like that to be able to have seen that side of him. Uh, don't get me wrong. I felt many times like he and I were competing because there was times when they could have passed the torch earlier, you know, but I also know that he was trying to build something to a crescendo, to a level to make something so big that it was just going to send shockwaves across the whole wrestling industry. So I understood it. And, and for the others, the ones that were, you know, were trying to be in that top spot and felt like he was holding on a little too long, they have a different story because they were in a different place. You mentioned a few times, right? We talked about suicide, and you went this horrific accident, and I could imagine it, the struggles you had to go with and the positivity you brought out. May I ask, was there a thought process that you felt you let down your entire team because of this accident and you might have destroyed everything that they were building? Hands down. First thing... First words I uttered out of my mouth to Dusty and Jim Crockett both was how sorry I was. As I was laying, I'm laying in a bed, in a rotokinetic bed, paralyzed from my neck down, and all I can think about is I had this whole organization built around pushing me to the moon to be their flagship, to take them to the next level in this battle we're in with the WWF. And, uh, and it, it, it was... It, it took me a long time to get over that piece of it because I watched from a hospital bed as they were making moves and doing things 
that I knew in my head were ultimately going to damage the company yeah. out of a reaction. And that, that certainly, that certainly got that's that's a tremendous burden. There's a lot of burdens physically, mentally. So you got to give yourself a lot of props for for hanging in there and and doing that and becoming the man you are today. It's pretty incredible. So I applaud you for that. I definitely applaud you for that. Can I ask you, was that accident um, preventable? Absolutely, hands down. There. There are very few things in this world that you can categorize as a true accident. Had I been driving slower, it it wouldn't it, it could have still happened, but it wouldn't have been as bad. Had I known to like look at my equipment better, I'd have realized that three quarters of my tire that I couldn't see the way the car was lowered were bald. Mm -hmm. and it only had eight thousand miles on it. You know. And so for the conditions and the weather and everything that was happening, I was driving too fast for the conditions, hands down. You know, did, did I constantly go up and down the same stretch of road at much greater rates of speed than I was traveling that night? Absolutely. I was driving slower, much slower than normal, but my much slower than normal was still too fast for those conditions, you know. Had I not been in a little bitty sports car, had I been in a SUV or a big truck, something in which I had headroom and and you know ample protection around me, I wouldn't have got hurt. Mm. Um, you know, so there is there is a a whole slew of things, and I I went on to I've gone on to work in both safety field and quality fields and all kinds of other totally non-related things where I've had to examine those things and really come to terms with the fact that. An accident is an accident is like an act of God, like a lightning bolt shooting out and striking a tree that falls on your car. That's an accident that you had no no way of foreseeing. Mm. But if it's pouring down rain, you need to drive with enough precaution to make sure that if you're going, you know, what appears to be uh, a shallow puddle that may cause you to hydroplane, that you've got a reasonable chance of coming out of it in one piece. You mentioned Dark Side of the Ring before. And look, as a wrestling fan, I think we all enjoy Dark Side of the Ring to a certain point. But in some points, I feel like they kind of maybe twist your words or, you know, kind of put things in place. I'm not saying they did that with you. But the, the one thing I, I found interesting, um, and I, want, I wanted to know what you were thinking, was you, you had this accident, right? And you're married to your first wife. And, you know, you're going through these struggles, and then she's by your side trying to help mend you through. And then later on in the show, you say, well, I continued to just have extramarital affairs, do that. No, that, she, that she said that. She did. Okay. Yeah, right. So, right. I forgot. that. Yeah. So I apologize for that. How did, how did that make you feel? The relationship with her was, was obviously damaged before all this took place and after the fact and all the things and, and whatnot when you're in the throes of the emotion of the struggle I was five months in a hospital five months and when when all the the lights come off and you're no longer in the in the movie in all the drama and all the excitement and you come back head to head and you're looking at your other eyeball to eyeball and trying to decide whether you really even want to be around this particular person or not, things happen. And it happens to everyone. Mm -hmm. And uh, that everyone that doesn't even come from the lifestyle that I came from. And uh, I think the, the picture was painted a little, a little different from her perspective because I think a lot of things came to light to her during that whole time that I was in the hospital. And then when I came, and then we came out and, and we're not, you know, on top of the world anymore where they don't have the, the bright future we once had, I think there was a lot of, uh, you know, where, where the, the bitterness, the maybe the depression, the this to that, the other, all played into those scenarios. And uh, that's really what the rest of the story that probably wasn't portrayed real well 
uh, in that portion of it. But but I would never be objectionable to her saying the way she, it made her feel because she, truly she was hurt by the things that happened. And, and to be honest, I think it's probably hard for her to look. You're, you're this good-looking guy, super famous. There probably had to be a lot of pressures on her even before your accident and then to add the accident on, it's oh, hands 10 down. times more, right? Yeah, you can't... You're, you you can't serve two masters, and the, the that old uh, rock and roll song about a road and no place to raise a family. Well, mm. the wrestling business is no place to to be committed in in to anything but the thing that you're most passionate about. And what I was most passionate about was being in the in the industry and all the things that came along with that. And the road life, you being on the road thirty and forty. 60 days at a time uh, in, in those environments w was not conducive to, you know, to trying to keep anything together in the way of a long-distance relationship. It just wasn't practical. And to, and to just to, to tip the whole thing off to the, uh, the worst it possibly could have been, the moment I got married and came back to after the break to the wrestling industry, Bill Watts takes my brand new bride off to the side and says, "Oh, by the way, we're now pushing him as a, a you know, a sex symbol, <laughs> and you're yeah. no longer allowed at any of the buildings in, you know, anywhere wow. you can go where she once traveled with me and went places occasionally and all this stuff. That was all now off limits. So uh, you you had to make choices, and and some of them aren't pretty, and some of those are uh, uh, preventable, but you would not be able to." survive in that fishbowl and and not play the part and it was not a it was not just an on-camera role back then it was a 20 it was it was the day before kayfabe was broke if well, you if you were that character you were that character but that's that's what i'm thinking i'm thinking look you fall in love you want to get married right that's the how we're taught the, the natural thing to happen but at that point you're not magnum ta and all of a sudden now you become this icon at some point you're like Maybe I should have held off on the marriage thing a little bit. And, and you know, there, there's things that about the whys and the wherefores and why all that came to be that, you know, in retrospect, you know, I can say, you know, hey, you know, that, that was just a really bad. I, I could have just said right then, you know what, we probably should just. Let's have a long engagement. Happen. Let's have you know, a long. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You might, you might just want to rethink this, this yeah. whole thing. You know how good a deal I am because I, I may not be that good a deal. Take our time. But, That's a, you yeah. know, but to be fair, uh, it, it was a horrible position to be in as a woman, mm. uh, and so that's why I really just kind of quiet about her say and her perspective because there are uh, there are other perspectives, but there was enough bad done on the front side of that that I'll give her that mulligan because it's really it's not worth it. Well, I love the fact that you look at both sides of the story, right? I mean, that's what most people should do. They should think about, like, well, how the other person feels. It's a great answer, man. It's really – that's why I like Dark Side of the Ring, but there's some points I feel like not everything has to be so dark. How about the good side of the ring once in a while? The light side. Yeah. Well, yeah. The, the biggest thing with them, and they promised me, and they held true to it, was I didn't want it to be a, a sad ending story. I wanted it to be a story – of adapting and overcoming and, and moving on to another chapter rather than, oh, this, oh, what could have been, what should have been, what all that stuff, oh, you know, you know, fell into, you know, he, he fell into this and that and the other and, you know, just travesty after travesty. And that's not the case. You know, we all have challenges in life and it's what we do with those challenges that, that ultimately, you know, d define us as what kind of legacy we're going to leave. And, you know, you can, you can say all these great philosophical things you want, but the proof's in the pudding. What did you really do? Mm. <laughs> yeah. What did you do at the end of the day? Yeah. Um, now, for me, these are the things I think about, right? Like, you know, I grew up, I loved wrestling, right? But the, to me, there's more to it, right? You guys are intelligent, and you, you really have the, these incredible lives, and you're just like normal human beings, but... Like I thought to myself, right? You had this. We talked about this. This small family, right? So you end up meeting the love of your wife, your life, your present wife now. But obviously, we all know she was married to Tully Blanchard before. So I thought to myself, man, like what kind of dynamic does that bring? Because you guys worked together, you knew each other. Wow, what 
kind of dynamic happens there. And there I raise his one, three, five, and seven-year-old for the next 15 years till they grow up, right? So he and I are so much alike in some ways in that we're both workaholic-minded type people to work towards a goal, be the best we could be. When I met Tully, he had the, the goal to be the best heel that he possibly could be, wanted to be the best in the world, didn't want to be, ever be somebody to be cheered. It wasn't one of those heels that secretly wanted to be liked and, and, and you have accolades thrown towards him. He wanted to be that nasty heel, and I wanted to be the baby face and do, do what I did. And we threw that chemistry into what we did, and it worked. And outside the ring, we both had our failures and our things we st- – struggled with and stumbled with and tried to find our way through. But because of the vicinity and the closeness and the group that we all interacted with, when things were going wrong in parallel universes and and they're having trouble and, and I'm and I'm in a in a crossroads and all of a sudden unlikely people find their way, you know, commiserating about, you know, what's going on. It it was a very unlikely situation, but the same things that that caused them conflict with each other uh, were a common ground for her and I and that we, we found some some peace in and uh, so it was yeah it was really unlikely it was it was bizarre but you know to his credit uh, it, talk about coping skills I mean he navigated his way through the emotional side of that and everything else and, it, and, and he'd had a failed relationship which is devastating in and of itself but then to have his counterpart seemingly pick up the pieces and keep that whole little unit going for, you know, two decades. Uh, and and we still coexist in this wrestling universe and go out and talk about the I Quit matches and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. We've got a, we still got this uncommon bond, unspoken respect that that is so far above and beyond <laughs> The, the things that happen down here that it just it supersedes it i don't i don't really know how to explain it but it's uh it, it is it's very unique and uh you know it wasn't a path that i would have ever figured or prescribed i mean i i had a my first child and and i uh, thought you know one was enough and i go from one to five to seven and like bing bang boom wow. at uh <laughs> you know at a very odd stage of my life and uh, here at 64 years old, have you know 16 year old twins, so, so go figure. Incredible, incredible, wow. Magnum, some of the pressures you faced as a star, and as many of them face today, um, was keeping a, a good physique. And I understand that Bruiser Brody gave you some advice years ago. Is is that true? Regarding- he saved my life. Okay. He, he absolutely, completely, hands down, saved my life. I, I was. Uh, I was in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, Ray Hercules Hernandez had just come in from Florida. He had a bag of performance enhancing elements that was like the size of a grocery bag. And uh, and I at that time thought that I wanted to be as big as the Road Warriors. Yeah. And and I was like a 230 pound guy. And uh, so I start, Ray and I started working out together and I got up to 270 and Ray got up to about the same in a very short period of time and I walked in a dressing room and Bruiser Brody was saw me come through the door and he just said he said man you look amazing and I said and of course that boosted my ego and I felt good and I'm all jacked up he said but I want to tell you something if you become a star and become successful because of just the way you look and the size that you carry and you have to do something year round to maintain that size, then you have just written your own epitaph yeah. because it will take you out. Yeah. And the light bulb just went poof, went off in my head. And he said, learn your craft, learn your trade, find a way that you can reasonably maintain the best version of yourself that you can, and you'll have a long career. And I mean, I just, like I said, I. I because I, I was going to 300 pounds sure. come hell or high water, and I was on my way. <laughs> you know, and, and, uh, and, and I said, you know, that, that is some, the best advice I've ever heard in my life from this big monster of a man yeah. who had taken a liking to me for some reason. Yeah. And uh, Frank and I maintained 
uh, uh, amazing friendship after that, and uh, and he did. It changed the whole forecast of the way I looked at the business, and what I wanted to become, uh, and and the way I you know didn't go down that road of of uh, I've got to be jacked to the gills to be the best version of me that that someone will buy and want to see. Right. Yeah. It's amazing. When you first got to the studio, we were talking about the signings you were just at and how this wrestling thing has evolved with all these signings and everything else. And I was thinking about, obviously, your career and where you were. And at the time, I think Flair was champion. If this accident doesn't take place, clearly you were going to become the new heavyweight champion. Do you think Ric Flair's historic story of this iconic wrestler remains the same, or does he get pushed into the oblivion? Well, I'll blow your mind worse than that. What would Sting have been? Mm. Yes. Forget Rick. What What would Sting, yeah. where would he have rolled into the game? Right? That's why you're smarter than me, man. I wasn't even thinking about that. You know, because Lex Luger, Sting, the Road Warriors, Barry Windham, they all got these big money contracts after I crash and burn. Nikita gets turned babyface. He gets a huge, you know, bajillion dollar contract. And the the world that I lived in was measured off the work and the the lineage and the history and the Harley races of the world and the the Dory Funks and the Jack Briscoes and the men that had made, you know, wrestling what it was. And we were going in a toe to toe battle against New York to give a better bell time to bell time product than anybody in the industry. They were entertainment, we were wrestling, and we were fighting out their tooth and nail to bring that product out. So my question would be, you know, how would that landscape have, would have changed? And Ric Flair is the one of the greatest performers to ever lace up a, a pair of boots. I'll never in, ever say Rick would not have been umpteen world time champion and whatnot. We, he and I may have traded it back and forth, you know, where we, you know, a whole bunch, and and uh, and he may have jumped ship and gone to the WWE way sooner, and the Crockett's may still have crashed, and I may have gone to the WWE because mm. truth be known, Andre the Giant that gave me that name yeah. wanted me to go to the WWE before I ever went to Mid South before any of that ever happened. That, his game plan for me was to go to work for the WWE from day one. So it all happened, you know, for a reason, played out like it did. Uh, and I, I like to think that all that talent would have found its way through and still made something of itself and had opportunities, but it would have looked different. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. You mentioned Nikita Koloff. Uh, tell me about the man Nikita Koloff and the friend Nikita Koloff. Well, he and I shared what was really the defining moment of my career, first of all. The feud I had with him was the first time that I was the senior member in the ring. I was the general. I was the one that was going to make sure that this angle lived up to the hype, that we could go out there and have the kind of matches that I expected and that the fans expected. And, and we had one heck of a run for, for a number of months. So when I when I go down, and they turn him babyface, and I'm watching from afar because I'm you know still you know not engaged in the game in any way, shape, or form. I, I thought it was a moment of brilliance that you know we that Dusty did the switch on him, but it did him the most disservice professionally that anything could have ever had to him. And I say this for this reason: he was built to such a mega heel, and had been taken care of and groomed by. People like myself and people like Dusty that had worked with him and continued to make him this monster, that when he turned babyface, he didn't have the, the other side of the fence, those people still keeping him to maintain that ferocity as a babyface that he has as a heel. He became a softer version of himself that wasn't as marketably palatable to the wrestling fan as he was when he was that monster. And and it was a it was a quick fix, but in the long term, it wasn't the the best thing could have happened in his career. Best thing that could have happened was he and I to have taken that feud again 
when I was the world champion and him and I battling all over America, you know, with him chasing for the world title. Well, I mean, even with that, when he turns face, it seems like he, he also changed certain other things. He didn't look like he was probably hitting the gas as much as he was as a heel, right? No, and he got married. You know, he got he had been he was married to to Mandy, his first wife, who passed away from Hodgkins, and uh, and he and when when she got sick and things started spiraling that were outside of his control, a lot of things started going on in his mind, and and I, you know he and I never had the conversation about the gas and you know dropping down from 295 to whatever he you know eventually you know went down to, but he but. When the fans look at that, they don't understand all that, and they just see somebody that was once a monster is now a lesser version of that, and uh, it loses some of its impact. But beyond all that, uh, he and I developed just this tremendous bond outside the ring, a mutual respect for each other that had started there, this carried into a lifetime of friendship. Uh, he and I have been on many occasions spoken at, uh, churches and different facilities together and shared our stories and, and uh, common feelings uh, about our paths. And he, he's, just, he's just a pretty remarkable guy all the way around, way larger than that, uh, you know, once fearsome, you know, the guy that he was in the ring. He's impacted the world on a much larger capacity today than, than he ever did in the wrestling circle. When, when you were in the hospital, of course, there was that after magazine that had him on the cover. Do you remember? It said, Yeah, I have the cried tear. For, I cry for, yeah. Yes, a classic. And, and that helped start the, uh, the process going. But he was still a heel at the time of your accident. And I know a lot of the guys came to visit you. Um, did they have to sneak him in at all to keep Nikita cover? Did, or Nikita did didn't, come? Come, didn't come in then. Okay. Uh, they, Nikita was in Japan. Okay. When I had the accident, oh, I see. So they brought Arn and and Rick and Tully and uh, I don't remember who else. They brought them up a freight elevator. Okay. To 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 get into the ICU. Sure. Because they didn't know whether I was going to make it. Yeah. You know, I mean, it was it was very touch and go. And Rick laid the ten pounds of gold belt on my chest in the hospital, not the big belt as depicted in the wrestling show. It was the old 10 pounds of yeah, gold. The classic belt. The classic yeah. belt. Laid it on my chest. And he said, I'm giving you this one. And when you're ready, come to the ring and I'll give you the old one. That's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful gesture. Uh, little Patty out there is just asking. She's your biggest fan. He's your biggest fan ever. Uh, he wants to know if you like Journey. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah, I do. I do like Journey. <laughs> Listen, yes. I, w I want to thank you taking your time out of your very busy schedule. What an incredible interview, incredibly human being. Um, Inspiration, man. I'm going to hit you with something. My former, not my former partner, my partner in Florida used to have something called the Pharaoh's Final Question. I'm going to call this Phil's Final Question, where it's unscripted. Whatever comes to his mind, he may ask you if you like Iron Maiden. I don't know. We'll see. Phil? All right. Well, I'm going to pull one right out of the ether here. Go ahead. Um, I noticed a, a similarity in boots between a few of the wrestlers. I know Barry Windham has a styled boot, kind of a, um, I don't want to say a cowboyish boot or what have you, but I think you wore those as well, did you not, in ring boots and uh, any reason behind them? It was, uh, it was dusty, but well, we, all, we, we all envisioned ourselves, or at least Dusty and I and Barry, we all had this envisionment that we were some kind of reincarnated Cowboy Outlaws, something I don't know what. Like the James Boys. And, the, and well, we were the James we were the Boys. James Make Boys. no bones about that. Oh, I know that. But but uh, Dusty uh, is the one that turned me on to the Austin Hall Boot Company that made made those famous boots. They're and sweet. Yeah. Black Jack Mulligan wore them. Yep. Bobby Duncan wore Big them. Bumble, I mean, yeah. it, it was a host of of people that wore them, but they were iconic. Yeah. And I had gone to a pull-on pair of boots uh, when I first came there. But they were they were crafted up by another bootmaker, and they weren't nearly the ornate inlay and all the things that Austin Hall was able to do. So, he's the one that turned me on to it. And you had to be, you had to really like that because to be able to work in that jump, yeah. leapfrog, and drop kick and jump off the top rope and not break your ankles, you had to kind of be a certain kind of cat to do that. Yeah, and I, I was able to do it. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah, amazing. 
Well, well done, sir. I want to thank everybody for joining us in this special episode with the great Magnum TA. We'll be back in, I think, a half an hour with the Nasty Boys. Very busy night. Thank you all again for joining us. This is Mike Monty. And Phil DeCesare. It's number one pro wrestling broadcast until 6.30. See ya. See ya.